I believe it's time to be bold in defending the truth. We don't need to shove our beliefs down anyone's uh, face, but we need to be firm for those things that, that we believe in. Um, I was raised mostly in Georgia as a small boy, attended a Protestant church, and my family later joined the church. I, uh, years later, was able to serve a mission to North Carolina, came home a month and a half later and married my wife, Sean, who's been with me for 40 years. She's sitting in the audience. And we have seven children and 14 grandchildren, and one on the way. I learned many things as a young married person just starting out in life. I attended BYU. We were living in Provo, and I ended up taking a full-time job while I was a full-time student. I took a full-time job in Salt Lake. So I had to drive from Provo to Salt Lake almost every day and then back. And I remember most days when I was driving back, I would get towards the point of the mountain and it never failed. I would see a stalled vehicle right up at the top of the point of the mountain. And like most people, I would just drive on by. Now the main reason I drove on by is because I knew this much about auto mechanics. I knew that I would probably be the last person someone would want to stop and help them if they were stranded. Now this was before the time of cell phones, it was even before the time of pagers. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think Brigham Young was in one of my classes. It was a long time ago. But one night I'm driving home or one afternoon and I see a stranded motorist and I'm feeling guilty as I'm passing this motorist. And then I said to the Lord, Heavenly Father, I promise the next time I see a stranded motorist, I am going to stop and I'm going to help. So the very next day, I'm driving home. And as I'm getting close to the point of the mountain, I'm kind of looking up the hill and I'm hoping this is not the day. And sure enough, at the very top of the hill, I see this little tiny 1971 Volkswagen bug stranded on the side of the road. And as I'm getting closer, I'm thinking, Lord, please, please send help to this person. And the closer I get, the more cars pass it. And finally, I'm close enough. I'm realizing, nope, it's up to you, Phil. You got to do this. So I pulled in front of the car. I knew to do that part. I got out of my car, took a deep breath and thought, I'm going to do this. I turn around and I see this precious little old woman with a cane cat eye glasses and a little purse hanging over her left wrist and a cane in her right hand. And I thought, Lord, I really, really need your help. So I start walking back towards the front of her car and something odd happened. She turned and walked to the back of her car. I thought, oh well. I got to the front of her 1971 Volkswagen bug. With great confidence, I leaned over, grabbed the hood, lifted it up, and immediately realized why her car had stalled. There was no engine in the car. Moments later, I see this little face peering around the side, looking at me, and then I realized, you idiot. The engine in a Volkswagen Bug is in the back, not the front. So trying to regain a little bit of my pride, I looked, and, I looked at her and pointed at the tire and said, I, I just wanted to make sure you had a spare tire. She kind of smiled and walked back towards the car, the back, and I closed the hood. So I followed her to the back of the car, and I noticed that she had lifted this little tiny hood up, and she had a real small little rod holding it up. And she handed me this can, and she said, young man, I've had this problem many times, and I know how to fix it, but I, I could use your help with this can of WD-40. And I thought, sure, I can do that. What's WD-40? I know this sounds pathetic. It was many years ago. So she hands me this can of WD-40, and she said, all I need you to do is put the little red straw in the nozzle, and then I know how to spray the carburetor. I thought, I can do this. I can do this. So she hands me the can, and I realize I'm shaking, and I have the straw in the other hand, I'm shaking and I'm taking all these jabs and jabs and jabs and I can't get it. And then this sweet old lady gets her face right next to mine. We're both looking at that nozzle into the straw and I'm thinking, I can do it. And finally I made perfect contact and without thinking, I pushed down on the nozzle 
and blasted a can of WD-40 into the face of this sweet old lady. She yanked her glasses off and she looked like she'd been snow skiing all day at Park, uh, Park City or something. She grabbed her purse, cleaned the WD-40 out of her eyes, cleaned her glasses, grabbed the can from me and scurried back to the engine. And now I'm feeling like a total fool. But I thought, you know, I'm going to learn something about a carburetor at least. So I, I lean in and she takes a butterfly nut off the top and she hands me this butterfly nut and she says, hold this. And I thought, I can do that. I can hold that. So I'm holding this butterfly nut while she has this can of WD-40 leaning over to spray the carburetor. Well, I didn't have a very good view and I thought, I want to at least figure out where a carburetor is on a 1971 Volkswagen Bug. So I leaned in really close to her. A couple moments later, she kind of did this to get me out of the way. So I pulled back, and when I did, I knocked the little arm that was holding the hood. It came, slammed down on the back of her head, through her nose, onto the carburetor and burned her nose. I jumped back, she pulled her head out, she threw the cap on the carburetor, she slammed the hood down, she kind of did this towards me, she said, young man, don't help anybody else today. Then she ran around to the front of her car, opened the door, jumped in the car, turned on the engine, and left me in the dust. As I stood there in her wake of dust, I realized I was still holding that butterfly nut. And two thoughts occurred to me. Well, you can chase her down and give her the butterfly nut. And the other thought was, if you do, who knows what else she's going to pull out of that little purse. So I kept the butterfly nut. And for years, I've wondered whose grandmother that was and how many times she told that story about that dorky young man trying to help her. What I learned from this is how important it is for us to be prepared in life, especially with the gospel of Jesus Christ. My wife and I have had the opportunity to raise our children in the gospel, and I know Rod asked a question earlier about how many have had wayward children. Most of our children have become inactive or left the church. My wife and I have remained active. Um, I have We've both taught classes. I spent about 15 years teaching gospel doctrine, a few years early morning seminary. And then about three years ago, we were both called to the stake president's office and given a calling that neither of us expected we would ever have. I was called to be a stake patriarch. And I looked at the stake president and I thought, my hair's white, but do I really look that old? It has been, and my wife called to be my scribe, it has been the most amazing experience of our lives. And what it did for me is it caused me to stop focusing on worldly things and to start focusing on spiritual things. And my wife will echo the same. As I thought about this presentation, about being bold for the truth, I was thinking about the Savior you know, contrary to what many people believe, Jesus did not come to this earth to unite. He came to divide. He divided the sinner. He divided the wheat from the tares, good from evil. You don't call someone a viper, as he did the Pharisees, to make friends. He was bold. He spoke the truth, and I believe he expects us to do the same. He also loved, healed, prayed for, and died and rose again for those who would follow him. We live in a world of confusion where right has become wrong and wrong is right, where science is based on feelings, not facts where relationships are electronic, not personal, and where God has been replaced by the precepts of men. A world of confusion, the worldwide decline of religious belief, unchecked political corruption, 
men competing in girls' sports and competing in female beauty pageants, men and fathers depicted as bumbling idiots on television and in the movies, women encouraged to be strong and powerful, taking on masculinity, while men are emasculated, weak and dependent, no longer encouraged to be the protector or provider. Children are now being taught that gender is a choice and even encouraged to consider changing their gender if they believe they are in the wrong body. Families are being broken up with a divorce rate averaging more than 50%, and with second marriages, it's even higher, as much as 67%. The number one reason for divorce in America? Infidelity. Now, the world is a much, much different place than it was when I was growing up. I tell young people when I give them a patriarchal blessing, when I was young, if we wanted to get in trouble, we had to go find it. You carry it with you all day long, 24-7. Kids today are exposed to things that I never saw growing up. The New York Times recently reported from a nonprofit child advocacy group, Common Sense Media, that the average age of a young person having their experience to online pornography is 12 years old. By age 17, three quarters of teens have come across online porn, whether they're searching for it or not. According to this report, 58% of teens say they accidentally viewed X-rated material in the course of using social media, clicking on online ads, or browsing the internet. And one of the most shocking statistics to me was Nearly 42% of teens reported viewing explicit photos and videos online during the school day, either on their own personal smartphone or a school device. None of this is simply a societal evolutionary process of modern thought. It has been planned and calculated by Satan since Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden when he declared that he would reign with blood and horror upon the earth. Lucifer has waged a war on mankind ever since the beginning, and in the last days as his time comes to an end, he has increased his attacks on the family because he knows the family is an eternal unit providing strength, love, and protection. Who do you think coined the phrase divide and conquer? If he can divide the family, the mother from the father, the son and the daughter, it is much, much easier for him to attack and conquer the individual. The family proclamation to the world was read by President Gordon B. Hinckley as part of a message to the General Relief Society in 1985. Let me share just the first two paragraphs of this proclamation. Again, it was given almost 30 years ago. Quote, We the First Presidency and the Council of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints solemnly proclaim that marriage between a man and a woman is ordained of God and that the family is central to the Creator's plan for the eternal destiny of His children. All human beings, male and female, are created in the image of God. Each is a beloved spirit son or daughter of heavenly parents. And as such, each has a divine nature and destiny. Gender is an essential characteristic of individual, premortal, mortal, and eternal identity and purpose." End quote. Now, of course, there is much more to the proclamation, but I remember when it came out back in 1995 and I heard it, I thought it was wonderful, but it didn't seem like it was, you know, new doctrine or anything. I didn't realize until so many years later how powerful it was. Then they added, we call upon responsible citizens and officers of government everywhere to promote these measures designed to maintain and strengthen the family as the fundamental unit of society. The Lord in his wisdom made it clear that the day would come when the family would be attacked like never before and when marriage would no longer be the norm. 
One statistic I did not state was the increase in cohabitation instead of marriage. The Lord also prepared the saints for the day when marriage only between a man and a woman would be challenged and gender would become a question of choice instead of eternal identity. Not many would have made such predictions 30 years ago, but the Lord knew, and he shared it with our prophet and apostles to help us prepare for our day. My brothers and sisters, we are living in the end of the end of days. The times of tribulation are on our doorstep. Mark my words, they've already begun. Our Savior Jesus Christ will return to the earth in our day, not decades from now, not 15, 20, 30, or more years from now, but in our day. I see it every single week when I place my hands on the heads of a young person and the Lord tells them how important and special they are to him and why they have been sent to the earth in this day to help prepare and usher in the second coming of our Savior. Would it shock you to know that there are wards and stakes that refuse to discuss the proclamation of the family? While the Lord has taught us from the beginning to love one another, he has never told us to condone or embrace sin. Nothing says we shouldn't love all of our brothers and sisters, but we are not to condone sin at any level. Books by modern day prophets have been taken out of Deseret Book. You won't find the miracle of forgiveness by the prophet Spencer W. Kimball. You know why? Because its message of repentance is hurtful to those with differing views of morality. This is a book written by a prophet of God in our day. And modern day historical church revisionists who parade as scholars but write books that defame Joseph Smith by citing lies and distortions of the truth from known critics and excommunicated members of the church. Those are the sources they use to write these books and make these claims. Now, I don't care what position these deceptive authors hold in the church, whether they are a bishop, a stake president, or even a patriarch. They promote half-truths, distortions, and just plain lies that make Joseph Smith, his father, and early church leaders out to be gold diggers and treasure seekers filled with pride and ulterior motives. Those baseless accusations in their popular books are actually used by the enemies of the church today to lead many of our youth out of the church. The statistics are so high on how many millennials, they're not here today because they're leaving the church because of books written by supposed historians in our church, lying and defaming the character of the greatest prophet, Joseph Smith. It's a travesty. We're also beginning to hear some strange new beliefs that are being circulated throughout the church. And I don't have time to get into these. I'm just going to skip that. One of them is this idea of multiple mortalities. Don't worry if you don't get it right in this life. You're going to have many, many, many more opportunities to be born again and start all over. That, my friends, is an absolute lie. Today is the day to prepare to meet the Lord. Today is the day to repent of our sins and accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today is the day to make choices that impact us for eternity. We don't get another chance. This is our second chance because we, we chose right with our first opportunity. We are seeing this max exodus of millennials and one of the reasons they're leaving is because they've lost faith in leaders of the church, especially past leaders. And I've thought a lot about that. I thought, it's amazing that people can base their testimony on a person and then leave the church if that person doesn't live up to their expectations. So I thought a lot about that and it occurred to me, the next time you see someone 
tell you they're leaving the church because of issues with early church history, tell them don't be angry with Jesus for choosing Judas as an apostle. The church has always had issues of the weakness of men. Now, that sounds a little tongue-in-cheek, but it's true. It doesn't matter to me the mistakes of early leaders. All I care about is the gospel of Jesus Christ has been restored, and his church is here to help all of us, products of the weakness of men. Our leaders are not perfect. They are not infallible. They are human like you and me, and sometimes they make mistakes. Just remember the pool that God has had to choose from. All of the perfect people left with the guy named Enoch. So there are no perfect leaders in the church from the very bottom to the very top. Elder Dieter Uchtdorf, in 2013 in a general conference, he said this, I suppose the church would only be perfect if it were run by perfect beings. God is perfect and his doctrine is pure. But he works through us, imperfect children, and imperfect people make mistakes. Look at how many times Joseph Smith was chastised by the Lord. Did he hide that? No. He made it scripture to show that even he, a prophet of God, made mistakes and was chastised by the Lord, and he accepted that so he could do better. So what exactly are we defending today? We are defending the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ as revealed to modern-day prophet, the prophet Joseph Smith, contained in the Book of Mormon, the Bible, and modern-day scripture. You know, recently I was thinking about the more than 45,000 different Christian church denominations on the earth, and it occurred to me that unlike those who belong to the restored gospel, each of those churches must base their belief in Jesus Christ on words that were written about 2,000 years ago in several different languages, translated and interpreted by scores and scores of different people over the ages into more than 2,877 different Bible versions. Remember, Jesus spent three years teaching his apostles his gospel, including the ordinances of the sacrament, how to pray, the reality of the Godhead and the organizational structure of his church as contained in the book of Ephesians, the apostle Paul said, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Then, this is the kicker. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. It is amazing to me how wonderful it is to have a church that is led by our Father in heaven through a prophet. Amos made it clear the only time you'll receive revelation for the people is through the prophet. That's the difference between the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and 45,000 wonderful organizations that also believe in Jesus Christ, but they're carried about by every wind of doctrine by the cunning craftiness and deceit of men. We have been blessed to have the gospel of Jesus Christ. The confusion in the world today is not just a natural process due to the weakness of the flesh. Make no mistake, it has been organized and orchestrated by Satan himself. In these last days, he has turned up the heat and the intensity of his attack on truth and righteousness with so many Christian denominations, not to mention pagan and religious or religions and those who don't profess to believe in God, the world at large is floundering in misperception, deception, and sin. Did anyone here have the opportunity to see the 2022 Commonwealth Games opening ceremony in Europe? It's a good thing, because I'm going to shock you for a moment. This was like the Olympics in Europe. 
This event was kicked off with a satanic bell worship ceremony. Now, the narration of the ceremony was all about the world coming together, humanity at its best. Unfortunately, for most who participated in this evil parade, they had no idea of the actual message and events they were promoting. The opening scene starts with the video, and I'm going to show you that in a moment. It was a 30-minute video. I had to condense it to four minutes, so it's going to go really fast. But the opening scene, you see these, the heavens open, and you see these, these shards of glass flying to the earth. They represent the fall of Satan. Glowing shards of fractured light falling to the earth represents Lucifer and the loss and the war in heaven and the banishment of him and his followers to earth. People then around the world pick up these orbs, these evil spirits of Lucifer, and gather them to a tower of Babel they are building to unite all nations. And then the entrance of a massive mechanical bull, which represents Moloch, the idol in the likeness of a bull. A few minutes later, one of the women holds her hands up to the angry bull with a peace offering that tames the beast. If you remember in the scriptures, the apostate Israelites offered what they offered to Moloch. Do you remember what they offered? Their infant children as burnt sacrifices. You shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Moloch. Passing through the fire was an abominable practice in which people sought to appease the heathen god Moloch and seek his benefit by sacrificing their own children by fire. Now the ceremony continues as everyone then bows down to the beast, representing yielding to the Antichrist in the last days. And then at the very end, they all come together and have a great big party at the Tower of Babel where they worship the beast. So hopefully this video will play. Here we go. So here come the followers of Lucifer being cast to earth. Then people notice these things. And out of curiosity, they go out and start gathering. And what they're really gathering is evil. Here she's praying to this thing. And then in the ceremony, a, a gentleman is beating a drum, telling the world to come together. And there's a tower behind them. It's the Tower of Babel that they're building to bring the world together. And of course, we know the Lord comes down. We know the story. He destroys the tower, divides the people, confounds their languages. Then they're scattered throughout the face of the earth. Again, this was hosted in England, and the new king of England was there in part of this. So now they're all gathering with their shards. You can see the magical attributes. They're gathering from around the world. They're going to meet the bull. Interesting that it's women who are pulling this bull in over their backs. This bull arrives into the arena and it's massive. Red eyes, fire shooting from its mouth. It's angry and it terrifies the people so they all run. But a few moments later you'll notice the women gather back. They stand in front of this bull, Moloch. And one of the women walks up to him. She makes a peace offering. She tames the beast because of her offering. He kneels down. The people all gather back to accept the beast. And then, just as the scriptures teach us will happen in our day, they bow down to this beast, the Antichrist. The world comes together and worships and bows down to this beast. Now, after the ceremony was over, the creators of this event so kindly donated this massive bull to stay there in England 
so people can come and worship it anytime they would like. This rest of this is just showing all of the countries of the world coming together to worship this beast. But I'm going to move on. I mentioned earlier, as a patriarch, I have the opportunity to give blessings to young people every week, and I testify to you that God is sending the very best to the earth at this time in the end of the end of days. And he is bestowing incredible gifts and power on these noble and great ones, your children, your grandchildren, and even your great-grandchildren. Gifts such as discernment, wisdom, courage, faith, belief, charity, endurance, healing, and seeing beyond the veil. And he is warning them of the coming days of tribulation and the intensity of evil leading up to the Antichrist. When I see public displays such as a satanic ceremony in Europe, it confirms the reason Heavenly Father is not only sending his very best for last, but why he is clothing them with the full armor of God. He is also promising them that through their righteousness, they will help usher in the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's also promising most of them that they will live throughout generations of time. There's only one way in our day you can live throughout generations of time. This is happening today. If we want to be like the Savior, then we need to act like him. We must stand up for what is right. We must be courageous and defend truth and righteousness. We must have faith that God will loose our tongue in the very moment the adversary attacks. If you think it's difficult to live in the world now, just remember what President Nelson said in April 2018 conference. In coming days, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. We must prayerfully listen to the soft voice and comforting influence of the Holy Ghost that will not only bear witness of truth, but even bring words to our minds. Many years ago, I was on a business trip and I had a layover in Chicago, and I was the only person in the terminal. A few moments later, I looked up and I saw a lady about a half a mile away walking towards me, and I figured she'll probably sit in one of the other seats. Amazingly, she sat right next to me. Now, I was in my mid-30s, we had a few children at the time, and she started talking to me, and the conversation became a little uncomfortable, and I realized she was being flirtatious, so uh, I started kind of doing this, 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 and finally I said, so I'm married, kind of a dumb thing that popped out of my mouth, and she said, oh, okay, and I said, I have children, and she says, oh, wonderful, how many children do you have? And I said, we have five. All of a sudden, her countenance changed. She stood up, threw her hands on her hips, and started pointing her finger at me and lecturing me how I was part of the people destroying the world with overpopulation. Her lecture went on for 10 minutes. As she continued screaming and yelling, and her face is red, I'm thinking, Lord, help me. What do I say? What do I do? Finally, she finished, and she stood there. <sighs> And I said, are you done? She said, yes. And then something popped in my mind and I said, I just have a couple of questions for you. How many children were in your family? And she kind of looked away and said, eight. And I said, oh, really? And, and which one were you? <clears throat> Number eight. And I said, oh, really? Wow, just imagine. If your parents felt the same way you did, I wouldn't have wasted the last 30 minutes of my time now, would I? <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting those are necessarily the things the Lord is going to put into our minds to speak, but what I am telling you is that I refuse to listen to the philosophies of men, those who are too weak to keep the commandments of God and instead pervert them to fit their own needs. The fact is, no matter how loud someone yells, truth will never conform to their beliefs. Ever. Truth is eternal because it comes to us from an eternal Father in heaven through his righteous and only begotten Son, 
Jesus Christ. I have more, but I am trying to be uh, cautious of time. I do want to end. I feel like it's appropriate for me to do so in telling you I know that Jesus is the Christ. I know he is alive. I know he is directing his church. I know he will return in our day. I know that our Father in heaven loves us and gave us an eternal plan of happiness that families can be together forever. I know the Book of Mormon is the word of God. I know that Joseph Smith was a prophet. I know that Brigham Young was a mighty prophet who followed him. And I know even though we still have weak men on the earth today, President Nelson is a powerful man of God and a prophet of God. And I share this testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.